Hello, everyone. Welcome to Functional Comp 2022. Uh, we have with us Simon Thompson here joining us from Canterbury, UK, and he's going to be talking on uh, language independent repatrings through language specific rewrites. Over to you, Simon. Okay, thanks very much, and thanks for the invitation to speak at Functional Comp. I've been thinking about refactoring over the last uh, 20 years or so, and this is a a reflection on, on um, some ideas that I've come to more recently. And in particular, I want to think about, uh, talk about um, the way in which <clears throat> we can build refactoring tools uh, to be as trustworthy as possible. And some ideas that have come out from that. So let me share my screen. Okay, let's get started. So just to say, what is refactoring? I'm sure we all understand what it is, but let me just, just give a definition to get us started. So refactoring is the idea that we are transforming code to improve it in some way without changing what it does. We may be changing how it does it, but we're not changing what the code does. Okay. In practice, what does that mean? We still, despite what people have been predicting for, for the last 50 years or so, it's still the case that a program or a, a, a system, a project is a large body of text. We haven't moved beyond using text as a way that we represent programs. So in practice, what it means is transforming this large body of text so that it's still recognizable and acceptable to the, the person, the people who wrote it. So. We have to make the change, and on the one hand, we have to make a change to make sure it's um, correct. We haven't we haven't broken the code. On the other, we have to do it in a way that the code we can see, look at it, we can still recognize it's the code that, that we wrote, albeit modified a bit. So we have those two tensions. We want to make important semantic changes, but we want to leave the surface the way it appears, looking as um, as close to what as, as close to what it was um, before it was transformed. Now, what's happening under the hood? I've, I've said that we're working with with text, but of course we're not. We're working with a complex semantic object that includes type system. Might include types. It might include type classes. It might include uh, static and perhaps dynamic types. Um, it includes bindings. So associations of, of names to the, the place where they're defined. It might include various kinds of effects. It might include a macro system. It can include a whole lot of, of, of different complexities. But what's interesting is that those are the things which have to be dealt with in a compiler. And I'll come back to this, that idea a bit later on in the talk, but we're working. Crucial thing for the moment is that we're, uh, to, to, we're working with a complex semantic object. And we have to reconcile editing that complex semantic object with the textual form being okay. So that's our, our requirement. So how do we give people assurance that what we're doing to their code is safe? Um, you know, this is really quite serious. What we're doing is we're writing a system which says we're going to modify your code, but trust us, it doesn't, um, it will not break any, um, it will not break your, your, your system, it will not break your code. So we have to find ways, as I say, we have to find ways of convincing users that our tools don't break their code. Well, what's the, What's the, um, the state of the art at the moment? It is to say, is the code still okay? And typically that means some sort of regression testing. So the assumption when people refactor is that um, if the code still passes all the tests it passed before, um, then the refactoring has been successful. But I don't think that's good enough in practice. It requires us to have written a really comprehensive test suite. And in practice, I, I fear a lot of people just have not done that. 
So what I, I first of all want to approach more sophisticated ways of providing guarantees of correctness. I'll talk about those. So we can we can improve the way we 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 check that the code does what it should do. And then I want to answer a second uh, set of questions, which is about how we build the system. Build the way we build a system can give assurance that the system is built in such a way that it's transparent, that it it um, is in, engineered in such a way that we can we can see how it's working, and therefore it gives us confidence that the system is doing what it should be doing. And I'm going to come to that a bit later on. And that's where the, the language independence, language dependence comes in. But let me just talk a tiny bit more about um, approaches we can take to improving the assurance that uh, we want to give people about refactoring. Now, when we talk about assurance, there are two things, two things potentially going on. One is we can use um, it's a technique we, we can use. We can use um, we can use testing, or we can maybe scale that up and use some sort of um, automation, some some um, some logic, technology, proof, and other other um, automated logic approaches. And also, we can think of doing two things. We can think of testing an instance of refactoring. So, what do I mean by that? What I mean there is. For example, in this project, we've renamed this function from foo to bar, and we want to check in this project that um, the refactoring has been successful. So we're checking a particular refactoring in a particular project. And that's, that's why we, that's the situation that um, we see at the moment. People will do that, um, will do that testing. They will, um, on the particular instance, and then move forward if it's been successful. But what else could we do? Well, the first area where we could do something um, a bit more, a bit more, um, uh, a bit more sophisticated, giving us a bit more, um, a bit more assurance, is instead of relying solely on regression tests, on unit tests, we can start to use techniques from property-based testing. Because what are we checking here? We're checking that the code before and the code after the refactoring behave in the same way. Now, in, in the case of a renaming, what we would like to see is that every client of that renamed function, so every function that calls the renamed function has the same behavior before and after. And, you know, we live in a, a functional programming world where property-based testing is available. And so one way of, of, of testing a particular instance is to use property-based testing to check every client of that function that has been refactored. And that gives us a way of automatically, <clears throat> automatically testing code beyond um, beyond having unit tests to use. So in fact, this, this, we can do that without there being any unit tests written, because what we're saying, we're writing the new test, which is the code before equals the code after. Um, and so, and using PBT in a, in a functional programming context will allow us to, um, to check those kinds of properties. So we can improve things, even in this case of testing instances by scratching our heads a bit and seeing what um, what extra technology we can use to support our, um, to increase our assurance. But let's think where we can go on. Let's think about testing a refactoring itself. We have a, a refactoring engine. We have a, um, a tool for doing refactorings. And we let's see if we can test that whole engine. And how could we how could we think of doing that? Well, one thing we can do is just take the property based based testing approach, the quick check approach, one stage further. We can generate programs. We can generate refactoring instances, and then we can do property based testing with random inputs. Now, if again this is helped if we're working in a world which is um, purely functional, 
this kind of approach will just fly. We can, we can, again, we don't have to write any tests ourselves. We can, in an entirely, um, in an entirely synthetic way, we can test our refactoring. And there are two ways we can do this. Um, one is the what I was suggesting earlier on. We can check the old code against the new code. <clears throat> that's a nice, that's potentially, that approach works fine. There's also a situation, sometimes this is something that we would happen when we wrote refactoring tools for Erlang. There may be two refactoring tools around. And one great way of um, checking their behavior is to check the two tools against each other. And we did that with a, we were writing a tool called Wrangler. We had some colleagues in Hungary who'd written a tool called Refactor Earl, and we generated random programs, refactored them in, under both of those, um, both those tools, and in fact found bugs in both tools because we're using each tool as an oracle for the other, as it were. But so we can use, if we have multiple tools, we can do this differential testing, this was work done by Dan, Danny Digg and his colleagues for Java refactoring tools. But also in a purely functional world, we can simply check the old code against the new code with randomly generated inputs. Okay, so we can we can improve what we um, what refactor, and this is work that I've done with with uh, Daniel uh, Horpachi and colleagues in uh, uh, Elta. At Rosh Laurent University in Hungary <clears throat> some time ago, but it's work that is um, still stands. It's work that can be applied in Haskell or OCaml, as well as in, in the case we were looking at, which was Erlang. So we can improve on the testing side. We can go from looking at simple instances to looking at, at the whole, all the um, all instances, if you like, of the um, a particular refactoring. But what can we do using more powerful technologies? What can we do if we want to start thinking about using logic, using proof? This is not so well developed, but work we have done um, I, now, some time ago in the uh, late uh, 2000s, um, I worked with Nick Sultana. And what we built there was a, a, a formal model of um, what's going on in renaming refactorings. We built what's a, a potentially name capturing lambda calculus and then proved that under the conditions that um, we normally have as side conditions for a renaming refactoring, if we implement it, when we implemented that, we were able to avoid name capture. So we were able to preserve the semantics of the program that way. Um, so we have done work in that area. And also, <clears throat> this is part of a, um, a larger project, again, with, with colleagues at, uh, at Bush Laurent University, to, to build, to scale up the, um, the work that we've done to more practical refactoring. Um, and, and there we've been, we've done some initial work on using the K framework, which is a, a um, framework for for building operational semantics of languages and using that as a as a, uh, a a framework for doing proof and the work that i'm talking about later on here <clears throat> about language independence fits into that that work on refactoring templates and um, how they can be used so we've got we can we can take this fully formal approach and this you know, is part of a long-term research project this is what we're doing um, but there is a fourth and this intriguing option, which um, let me just put that in front of you. Um, here we're trying to use some, some proof technology to show that a particular instance of a refactoring is, um, is correct. Remember what we're doing in a refactoring is we're taking code and um, rewriting it. So what I said earlier on what we can do is test whether the code before and after has the same behavior fine, we can do that. But why not? Could we indeed automate a proof that the code before and the code after has the same behavior? Every client of the renamed function um, has the same behavior before and after. Well, one way we could do that is to write a proof that those two, those two client functions, <coughs> excuse me, those two client functions have the same behavior. We could do that. 
We could do it by hand, but wouldn't it be nice if we could do it in an automated way? And I think there is, for small examples, um, for toy examples, we've been able to, to do this using an SMT solver, um, using uh, an SMT solver bound to, um, to Haskell. But that was a small, ex uh, a small experiment. In general, of course, proving that two functions are equivalent is a hugely complicated, um, it's a big task, you know, the two, proving two sorting functions, for example, a simple function. But if the, if, the, um, if the way in which those functions is implemented are very different, then it's very difficult indeed to think about how we would, um, how we'd automate a proof of, of their equivalence. But that's not the case here. What we're doing is taking a code base and modifying in a, in a very um, stylized way to replace one set of names by another set of names, for example. But the structure of the code is relatively unchanged. So I think in principle, this should be something that would be suitable for, for automated proof. We're not there yet, but I think that's, only, that's there is an interesting challenge, I think, for anyone in the audience who wants to take that up. So just to, to close this, this part of the, the talk, I think one thing that um, I wanted to, to get across is that we do have a number of different approaches to, um, to providing assurance um, that a particular refactoring tool does as it should do, using either testing or formal, formal logic, and working either at the instance level or at the whole refactoring level. So that's one approach. Um, on the other hand, <laughs> in some situations, people don't people don't necessarily want um, complete assurance. People are happy. I mean, for example, I've, I've heard people say, "Well, actually, if your um, if your tool is ninety percent correct, that's better than nothing." Um, I'll I'll solve the I'll, I'll fix the final ten percent, you know, by looking by by eye, checking the the, the places, um, checking the problematic places, perhaps the the places that that make the type the the type checker break. So I perform a refactoring and use the type checker to to push push it through. That's something that we all do in practice. So maybe we shouldn't worry too much about correctness. Um, and on the other hand. Um, Correctness sometimes isn't enough, that uh, people might be happy with 90% correct, but they have to have their layout 100% correct. And they have to have the layout looking as it was before. Um, so there are, there are, the human factors to this are, are tricky. And as I say, um, there can also be a programming, programming language um, dimension to this. A Haskell programmer might well say, well, if it, if, if it type checks after the refactoring, it's probably okay. Well, yes and no. Uh, Ninety percent of the time, you're right. There might be cases where it type checks afterwards, but the program has still changed. Okay, but let's let's set aside the the um, the question of proof and testing for a moment, and think about another way of providing assurance to people to people who are using our, our systems, and that. The way we can do that is through the way that we build the system. These are open source systems. People can scrutinize them. They can see how they're built. And because of the way they're built, we can provide assurance. And let's, let's, see, um, let's see what that means in a bit more detail. So we want to build tools that support, um, are easy to use, they're easy to extend, so they have components which people can repurpose. Um, and we want implementations to be straightforward. Um, now, what, what does a refactoring tool look like, really? You can see it at a, from a very high level. You can see it has these four stages. We take the text and you can see that we, the, the starting text is slightly different from the text at the end. We have done a little refactoring there. We start with text, we end with text, but really the crucial, crucial stages are working over this complex data structure that represents the program. 
And really, there are two stages to that process. In the first case, we, we do some substantial analysis of how the, um, of, of, of what the program does. We look at its static semantics, its types, its effects. Um, we resolve preprocessor commands and so on and so forth. And then we perform a transformation. So how can we try and give some, some structure and coherence to, to those stages? Now, the other thing to be aware of is that the first stage there is probably provided by a compiler. You know, what every compiler does is it will, um, it will take it takes text, it extracts the, the, the uh, syntactic structure of a program, but then given that syntactic structure, builds a whole edifice of, of other analysis on top. And so I think one thing that we should, anyone building a tool should certainly aim to do is to reuse as much from a compiler as possible. And that pushes, uh, that pushes the assurance question back onto the compiler builder. Now, how transparent, how, how well built, how well architected is the compiler? How easy is it to extract phases from that? And that can be different. Different languages can provide different levels of support or non-support for, um, for doing that. When we first started working with, um, with Haskell, GHC, this was around the 2000, it wasn't it really wasn't practical to work with GHC. And so we worked with another framework called Programmatica, which was, was aiming to build something that was, was more usable and modular, but in fact, never got, never got quite delivered. Um, so we worked with that and it, it was easier to work with that. It was easier to extract complex information from it. On the other hand, um, we ran, we had the problem that we were never able to deal with real Haskell, that is Haskell as processed by GHC, rather than Haskell from Haskell 98. And the fantastic work of Alan Zimmerman, um, who took our initial work with the hair refactorer and took it and uh, migrated to work with GHC, has been has had a, a, a huge impact um, on making the, the, the tool usable in practice. So the front end, we can really, we can really um, get from um, get from a suitably engineered compiler. So let's think about the transformation stage. What can we do to, to architect the transformation phase in such a way that it um, can give assurance? Well, let's, if we're thinking about architecture, there are really three, three ways we might think of, of, of that. We think of, of abstractions, how can, we, how can we hide, how can we build, tools in such a way that they are layered appropriately and using the right abstractions allow us to, to concentrate our, our effort at different layers on different aspects of, of uh, what's going on. We can reuse potentially components from other places and we can build, build libraries that support particular kinds of, um, of operations over these, these complex structures. Um, and as I say, we, we can use a, a, we can take the compiler front end really as a component that we feed into this, this discussion. Another very nice feature, and this is a, 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 an abstraction that is, has proved very useful in the refactoring field, is to say, let's separate out, because what, what's going on, what are we doing when, we, um, when we're doing the transformation? What we're doing is we're traversing a tree and we're making changes in that tree. Okay, it's a tree, it's a, maybe it's a, a, a DAG, a directed acyclic graph, the sharing there. It's also decorated with lots of, of syntax, uh, semantic information. But what we're doing is we're traversing through this tree in some way. And we can write each, each refactoring as a, as a recursive function versus a tree. There's a really nice abstraction here that says, separate out the transformation from the traversal. And this is the approach of, of strategic programming done by uh, the Stratego team and built into things like Strafunsky and Haskell, which have now turned into Scrap Your Boilerplate. So have turned into to frameworks for generic programming in Haskell. But the, the, the key approach, the key abstraction there is to separate what you're doing to 
transform the tree from the way the order in which you do it and that's what strategic programming does so that's a really nice abstraction in there um but what and i think that's it that's a key guide what we want beyond that if we can find it is something um that's simple enough that's general enough and is also implementable um and so the key insights i think of this of, i wanted to get across in this talk uh, are, are these um and this was really inspired by work with daniel Horpachi, um from elta i when i first started working in this area and for quite a long period after that i came to the conclusion it's impossible to think of doing generic refactorings every language is so particular that it's impossible to think of doing language independent refactoring but i i think what i learned from daniel is that we can a, a key insight is that actually we can factor those refactorings we do in a particular language into a language independent part and a language dependent part and that actually improves the engineering of the refactoring tool by making that separation um a second insight which i'm not going to talk about any more here is that <clears throat> i talked earlier about how important layout was work we did particularly with hu king lee on the hair tool and 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 the wrangler tool for erlang was to separate out layout dependent and layout independent aspects of refactoring so build a layout independent library on top of a layout dependent one but let's not talk any more about that let's stick with our um our insight about looking for language independent refactoring and i think just a parenthetical point here this is this isn't just for functional languages the examples here are from functional languages, but i think these abstractions will work for oo as well and that's another you know that's another discussion point so let's look at an example let's look at typical refactorings that we do in um in a functional language we do renaming we do generalization where we take a bit of a function bit of a function definition abstract it out and, and instead pass that information in through a parameter we reorder arguments and so on it's possible to see all those refactorings as examples of one particular pattern and that pattern is a what we could call the function transformation scheme and it says to to make this refactoring happen you have to do two things you have to change the definition um, and you have to change all the applications so it's a function it has um it has a definition and then it has uses throughout the program i'm writing this in a sort of a language independent way um just to to get across the point this could be haskell this could be erlang this could be um ocaml or whatever that's what we have to do and each uh, something like renaming reordering arguments regrouping arguments generalizing can all be implemented in this particular way so <clears throat> you know when we if we what we do in renaming is we, we change the name and the definition we change every instance what we do in in um in swapping two arguments of a two argument function is that we have to swap those arguments in the definition and then swap every um pair of actual parameters when we this is a more interesting example here this is generalization what we're doing on the left is that we have a function with a particular piece of functionality here three what we're doing on the right is we've abstracted that out into a parameter and then at every instance we have to pass that behavior in we've generalized we've got this is a refactoring that will en enable um us to write to re a typical refactory where we we say well okay we've got a particular piece of functionality but we can see we could use that in other contexts if we got rid of that particular parameter three and then we could use the two argument function <laughs> um so we've got those that pattern so i've been able to describe these examples in a language independent way we talk about the definition we talk about um the uses but i've only been able to do that by hiding complexity 
and I think this was the this was the insight that I hadn't. Um, this was the insight that was new, because just look at what happens in practice when I talk about function application. What have we got on the left? We've got some examples from Haskell. We've got f applied to x and y. Simple. Um, on the second line, we've got f applied, but f is applied um, as an infix operator. Um, in the third example, we've got f partially applied in the um, in a map because f is functions in Haskell are curried. Um, and in the, the bottom example, I've got an operator section. I've said, oh, let's turn f into an operator, and then I want to pass in um, a value to the first for the first argument. Um, so we don't just have function application in Haskell. We have these other variants. We have partial application. We have um, we have do-it-yourself infix, and so on. What about Erlang? Well, Erlang, in a way, is um, <clears throat> is worse. We have we've got a definition of f there. We've got a use of f in the second line in a spawn. Now there, f is being passed in as an atom, and we have to recognize that that atom, in fact, refers to the definition of a function. Um, and in the bottom line, we have this this Erlang notation. When you pass a function in, you have to say, oh, I want to pass in the function um, g, the, the, the one argument function called g. So applications are not all directly visible. We have ways in which they're hidden. And the ways in which they're hidden, the, the indirect ways you can, you can um, produce function applications are, um, are particular to the, the programming language. So how can we factor this into something that is, is um, language specific, but still has an aspect of language independence? Um, I'm just I'm talking about there, partial application, DRA, I'm just explain, read a reminder of that. Let's talk about how we can actually turn this into something that is, um, is language both language independent and language dependent. Here's our function transformation scheme. How can we think about um, doing that factor factorization? The way we can do it is by <clears throat> having a generic transformation. So this, this, the way we write the transformation is the same pretty much in every language. But then what we have specific to each language is a way of rewriting. Um, the results of what we see. And this has implications for the way that we, we write, the way we build tools, but also implications for the way that we might try and prove those tools correct. So let me just run through an example. So here's the, um, <clears throat> here's the function transformation scheme. We describe the new, the new function, f new. Um, and what we do is, the language independent approach to this is to say, just give me a description of the old function in terms of the new. So how I get the old function using the new function. So here we are, we've got um, the, 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 the generalization example that we saw earlier on, it's just using Erlang syntax now. And here I'm saying my new function is <clears throat> described at the top. And here is my description of the old function. And this is using Erlang notation. So we say f old equals fun of x, returning f new applied to x and three. So I give that single description and we will see that we can use that plus some language specific rewriting to give us what we need to implement this particular uh, transformation. So let's have a look at, what, at how this works. So, so here we are, is, is a, an application of the scheme. The scheme is up there in, in gray. And what I've got now is, a, is an example of um, <clears throat> a definition that, that uses F. So my old definition 
of G calls F on Z plus two. What do I do? I, in order to transform that, I take F and I replace it with what, um, what the second line says. So I rewrite it to, so I, I write it as this application of this um, function expression. So you could say, okay, I've done my refactoring. I've got a new version of G written in terms of the new F. That's my, my code will work. Um, you know, all my client code is, is going to work properly. But of course, the problem here is that it's completely unreadable it's, and it's unacceptable. So I've made the semantic transformation in this one step, but the only way it's going to be acceptable to, to readers of this is for me to, to do some further work to make this actually readable and acceptable. And of course, what I do here is I say, well, I've got a function expression, I've got a lambda expression applied to a value. I can reduce that. I've got a redux, and what I can do is reduce that to, um, to this. Now, you could say I could have done that anyway. I don't have to do this with the this single function f there. But the point is, doing it this way has meant that I just had to give a single description, which I can apply in other situations, like this one. I've now got a, 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 a symbolic reference to this function f. And what I all I need to do here is replace that function f with the same function expression as before. And now I have um, my new definition of G. And that's, I can't simplify that any further. <clears throat> but what I've got is something that, um, that works just using that single semantic transformation. I didn't have to say, oh, this is how you transform function applications. This is how you transform a, um, the function passed as, a, as an argument. That single description of the transformation as a um, described in the old in terms of the new and then rewriting when I can has given me, um, given me what we saw on the previous slide and has also given me um, what we see here in terms of um, the the redefinition of um, the redefinition of um, of G, and given the way that Erlang works, this is the best we can do, right? There's nothing else, um, um, nothing else we can do there to to improve that. That if we are passing functions in to higher order functions and we transform them, then we will finish up passing in functions, expressions, instead of simple, um, simple function names. Okay, so there we've seen how the scheme could be applied. But here's the rub. We've got, um, we've got our transformation. We said, this is how you describe F of old in terms of F of new. How do we know whether this is correct? Well, the answer is we should check that this actually is a true assertion. We've got the definition of F of old there. We've got the def definition of F of new, and we have said, this is how the two are related. Well, let's prove it. And it's not difficult in that situation to prove precisely, um, precisely that result. Um, Oh, sorry, and I thought I had that in, in a slide. Obviously, that slide has disappeared. But you know, if, if we rewrite, um, if we rewrite the instance of of, um, of f of new in there, we get to um, we can see that we do indeed have what we should have. So we get the correctness of that refactoring just hinges on the single way that we rewrite um, the old to the new. Okay, I'm getting close to the and we are we can begin to formalize this. We're looking at um, working on the, the, the framework we're looking at is, um, is core Erlang. So we're looking at um, proving results of um, about, um, about these sorts of transformations for Erlang, um, either in, um, in, the, in the COP proof assistant um, using using um, some sort of, of, of 
of logic. Okay, but just to say there is there's more than one example of this, and let me let me just show this quickly. I talked there about transformations that were based on um, based on changing the way a function was defined. We can do similar transformations in terms of the way that our data is described. So here, a, a typical refactoring we might do, we ha might have an ex a type of expressions. Um, here we've got numbers, additions, and multiplications. We might say, oh, let's refactor that. So we have, we just have a, a two constructors and a number, and then a binary operator. Um, and we fact that we lift out the, the particular add and mul multiply as examples of the, the binary operator. And here we see that we can describe the old constructor and apply to E and F in terms of the new. That's the by bin constructor applied to add E and F. And we can use a similar approach there, rewriting approach to transform this definition, this recursive evaluator, from the top definition to the to the lower one. So what we're doing there is we're applying these rewritings, not just inside expressions, but inside patterns. So on the um, on the left hand side of a pattern match, as well as on the as, as well as on the right. So that's a different kind of of, um, of transformation. And it's one which um, the, the correctness criterion that um, functions over this expression type should have the same behavior, um, but modulo the translation of values. We can't expect them to have exactly the same behavior because we're represent data, representing data in a different way. So we could say, well, all functions that return things independent of expression should, should have the same behavior. That could be sufficient. But we can also say you know, if, if what we do is um, have a functions over expression that return expressions, then if we apply the translation, then those, um, those functions should still behave correctly. So we have a, a similar correctness criterion there. Um, and just to look at the correctness question, <clears throat> and I think we got a real win here that what we're now doing with this, with this approach, is that we have one transform per refactoring. So what we did in the function case is we simply describe how the old function is implemented in terms of the new and replace all the old functions with that description. So we have one transformation, one proof that that, um, that thing is correct. And then what we might do is some generic, if you like, rewriting to tidy up the code. But those rewrites are the ones that apply in every, every sort of refactoring. And we just use them to tidy up, um, tidy up so that the code becomes recognizable. And these are, we might use a number of them, but we only need to prove each of them once, not, not for each refactoring, but, but for each language. And so we've done, we've got this factoring into a single correctness criterion per refactoring, and then proving correctness of all the, the, the rewriting code. <clears throat> now, and I think this is something that you know, really allows us to, to think in a, in a serious way about structuring a refactoring tool to support transparency of architecture and also to, to, to support a principled approach to proof. So you know, this, this is something that we, we're looking forward to implementing, looking forward to, to moving this forward for the next few years. But one thing that is is um, was a surprise was in fact this work what this work has done is rediscover something that we did ten years ago on migrating um, when you when you have a library migrating from an old API from the library to a new API um, and just just to take you through this code this was work with uh, <clears throat> work with Hu King Lee just a simple example there was a very nice example from the Erlang world. There was a big change from um, a, the regex library to the RE library. These are libraries for regular expressions. And quite substantial changes in the way that the, the, the structure of arguments to and the, the, the way that the, you did indexing into regular expressions and so on, quite substantial changes. And they, in the paper um, you saw just back, just there, we, we showed how you could, um, you could mitigate all those all those things. And the approach is this, I've just got some, some simple pictures here. If you imagine you have an API with a client, 
and then you you create a new API so the client code doesn't fit that API any longer. What do you do to mitigate that? Well, you build an adapter. So you you build an adapter. You wrap around your your client code to um, to allow or you wrap around the API so that your client code can still use it. But the key here is that actually what you want to do is then absorb the adapter into the client and rewrite it so you have a new client using the new API. And that's what we showed there. Now, this, it's, come, it's come full circle. We're still using the same technique, but we're now saying, in fact, you can think of, a refa of refactorings as API changes. They're really all about how you describe the old code in terms of the new code. And so we've, we, and this was an insight which was really not, um, <laughs> we were not expecting. So in particular, in the, in the, the case of the, all those, the, the function patterns, it's really about changing API and the way this approach of writing the adapter, in which case describing the, the old in terms of the new, and then rewriting the, um, using generic rewriting to um, a non refactoring specific rewriting to absorb that into the code allows us to do things which give us idiomatic code so we're keeping we're able to to give code that's recognizable and um is correct um and hey simon i just want to yeah. let you know we have reached the end of time but we can probably take a few yeah. more minutes yeah, okay, no, that's fine. I was just, and I've got to my end slide pretty much. So what's next? Looking at other patterns, looking at data, looking at proof, looking at um, extending this work. And just thanks to Daniel, Judith, Peter, Martin, Dominic, the Erlang Ecosystem Foundation, who've given us some funding for um, incorporating Wrangler into the Erlang language server, the Rota project team with whom I worked on a project in the UK and UKRI for support and um, Nick Sultana who worked with me on the, the proof work. And then just to leave you with this, that's that we can we can build um, we can build this this degree of language independence factor into language between language independent and language dependent by factoring between generic transformations and language specific rewrites. And now I'm going to stop. And thanks very much and apologies that I did run a tiny bit over, but that's it from me. Thanks a lot, Simon. Thanks for the wonderful talk. Um...